what has often been called the scandal of particularity. Is this idea that salvation is only to be found in Christ and in Him alone. Many people take offense to this Christian doctrine. They feel that it is too exclusive. It excludes other religions, scientific theories, and philosophies. Too restrictive, too prescriptive. But I think they're making a category mistake. Because I think the exclusivity of Christ is not in the same category as what they are thinking about. I want to give you an illustration. And as I do this, I'm going to be walking all the way down to get my clicker, which I forgot. (laughs) Thank you. Imagine the city of Burnaby, or the city of Vancouver, making a deal with Tesla, that you're only allowed to drive Tesla motor cars in the city. Just imagine that the city councillors came to a decision that there's too much pollution, and they need only electric cars on the road, and the only electric car of the category of electric cars has to be Tesla. Some backroom deal they made. That would be exclusive, right? And people will be offended and people will be pretty mad because Tesla is not the only electric car. Other makers also make electric cars. And theirs might even be better to drive than Tesla's. Who knows? But imagine something else. Imagine there's a huge snowstorm and you are trapped for the whole weekend in an auto parts store. No one can go out, no one can come in. You're going to be there for at least three days in an auto parts store and you have to survive. And in the store, they have many kinds of liquids, they have oil. For your, for your car. They have antifreeze coolant. They have sprays. They have all kinds of liquids, but the only liquid that could sustain your life is water. And they do have distilled water that they sell. Now, when you are stuck there for those three days, you are going to be told not to drink anything in the store except the water. It's going to be exclusive. You can't go and drink the gearbox oil. You can't go and drink the window washing fluid. You can't go and drink anything else. It doesn't matter how nice it looks. It doesn't matter how good you, th- you think it will be for you. It won't. The only thing, the exclusive thing that you can drink is the water that will be in the store. Now, what I'm trying to say is that these two exclusivities, the exclusivity of the Teslas driving in the city and the exclusivity of the water in the auto parts store are not the same. They are in two different categories. In the one, you can complain and you can say, this is not right to only exclusively drive Teslas. But in the other category, you can't complain, even if you want to, about having to drink water. Because it's only water that will give you life. And this is the exclusivity that we are talking about when we are talking about the particularity of salvation to be found in Jesus Christ. Let us read what John has to say in chapter 2 of his letter. I'm reading from verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him, 
if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that this is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they, are all, that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no liar is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for John who wrote this down. We thank you for everyone who participated through the ages to bring these words to us today. I pray that these words would be alive. I pray, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, you would open our minds and hearts and help us to understand, help us to know, and help us to live according to what we know. I pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. True faith and right living. Those two are like two sides of the same coin. Without true faith, you can't have right living. And right living will come from true faith. They are intimately connected and cannot be separated. John is giving us in this passage a lot of examples of true faith and of right living. And John doesn't develop his arguments like Paul does, which sort of works to a crescendo. John has an argument that he goes around and around and around, and he brings it up again and again and again in different words, but with the same basic understanding and the same basic message. We need to have true faith, and we need to live rightly. John says, for right living, he says, by this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. If we are living rightly, we are called to walk in the same way that Jesus walked. We are called to do the things that Jesus did. We are called to become Christ-like. This is non-negotiable. You cannot have right living, and therefore you cannot have true faith if you do not walk as Jesus walked. Now, early on in his letter, John told us that if we should fall, if we should stumble, if we should sin, that we have an advocate who will stand up for us in front of the Father. So John is not saying that you're going to walk perfectly as Jesus did. But he is calling us uncompromisingly to have this goal in front of us, to have this desire, to have this compelling unction inside of us to become like Jesus and to walk like Jesus did. And we have that Holy Spirit, as we said, who is like a GPS, and He can bring us back if we go astray. To walk the same way as Jesus walked is to do the things that Jesus did, is to choose as we walk, to choose to walk in humility and not in pride. To love instead of to, have, to lust. To be selfless instead of to be selfish. To act in humility with compassion instead of being aloof and selfish. To walk as Jesus did is the call for us. We are going to depend upon Him to bring us to that place. But you and I will make the decision in our own hearts and minds that this is what we want to do. This is what we are aiming for, to walk as Jesus did. That means we have to abide in Him. That means we have to keep His commandments. That means that we will truly know Him. Because if we don't truly know Him, we cannot abide in Him. If we don't abide in Him, we cannot keep His commandments. It is only God who gives us the strength and the courage and the determination to keep His commandments. So it comes full circle back to true faith. Because without us truly knowing Him, none of this can happen. But if we truly know Him, these things will happen. We will abide in Him. We will keep His commandments. And then we will walk as Jesus did. John is not only asking us to walk in the same way that Jesus walked, but he says another mark of Christian life, of living rightly, is to keep the new covenant, which is the old covenant. He says, Beloved, 
I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Come on, John, what are you saying? Is this an old commandment? Is this a new commandment? How can it be old and new at the same time? Well, I think what John is trying to get through to these hearers, because remember, he's writing to people who are Christians, people who are believers. He's saying that to you, it is an old commandment because you heard this commandment from the time that you started believing. From the time that you became a believer, a Christian, a child of God, from that time you knew the commandment. The commandment that rules all other commandments, which is the commandment to love our Lord our God above all else and to love our brothers or our sisters as ourselves. John saying that is an old commandment. You got it from the beginning when you became a believer. But maybe John is also alluding to the fact that this also was a commandment in the, even in the Old Testament from the earliest of times. Where God always spoke to his people to say, you need to love me first and above all other things. And you need to, to love your neighbor as yourself. But it's also a new commandment because this is something that Jesus really articulated. This is something that really got a life in the New Testament or with the, the, the coming of Jesus as he came to earth and as he ministered, as he taught about the kingdom. When he was asked what is the greatest commandment, he took all commandments and brought them together and said this, is the greatest. And this is the new commandment I give you. Love each other as I have loved you. So this is what I think what John is, is talking about. This old commandment is also a new commandment. But then he says something interesting. He says, I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you. He says, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. What's the true light that he's talking about? Well, it's the true light that Jesus brought. Jesus is the light of this world, and he came to this world to bring light. And the light that he brought is the presence of God. It's the kingdom of God. It is what Jesus brought into this world, and which is now in place in this world, and is going to increase until one day we see that the whole world will be flooded with the light of God. That the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That all the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdom of our God and of His Christ. The light started and the light is shining. And as the light shines, the darkness recedes. Last week we spoke about that. Light and darkness, these are not two competitors. Darkness is simply the absence of light. And when light comes, darkness leaves. Because darkness cannot remain in the presence of light. So to illust illustrate this, I was looking at this picture right here, which is the sun coming up on the earth. And as the sun rises, you see the darkness recede. The first rays of the sun, the light comes. And as the light comes, the darkness has to go. There is no choice to be made. The darkness cannot take this stand and say, well, I'm going to just stay here. No. When the light comes, the darkness has to go. Here's another one here. A new day dawning. The Gospel of John. You see the light coming from the one end. And bringing more and more and more light until the whole earth is filled with light. This is the image that John is, is, is connecting to. 
saying that the, the light has come, the light has dawned, the new light in Christ has come, and this light is going to take over the world. He says it is increasing. John, when he, when he looks at this, he says, um, uh, I'm writing this to you, he says, because this, this light is going to increase and fill the whole world. Now, here's the thing. This light is closely connected to Jesus Christ. He is the one that brings the light. And He is the one that brings the true understanding of who God the Father is. God is light. John told us, we read that earlier on in his, in his letter. God is light. And Jesus is the light that comes to illuminate the light that is God. There is no way for us to understand God unless we see God through Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, people had little bits and pieces as they tried to, to understand God. They would have maybe told you that God is a God of vengeance. God is a God of justice. At times, God is a God of mercy. God is a God of grace. God is a God who wants sacrifice. God is a God who wants His people to come and bring offerings to Him in the form of animals that they would sacrifice. Maybe those are the kind of ideas people had about who God is. But when Jesus comes... He says, what, what, you, what you heard in the past, those were like pointers. Those were like shadows pointing to the reality of who God is. And the real God is not a God who wants you to take an animal and sacrifice to Him. The real God just showed you what He's going to do through His Son as He sacrifices Himself for you. You see, the light that Christ brings is the light that is going to illuminate who God is. And there is no way for us to know who God is except through Jesus Christ. So when He becomes a human being, when He comes in human form, He comes to show us the Father. And if we look at Christ and His life and what He said and what He did, then the illumination comes and we start understanding who God really is. We start to understand that the depth of the love that God has for us. We start to understand the sacrifice that God is willing to make for you and me to come into relationship with Him. You start to see the compassion that God has for us. You start to realize this great God who created the whole of the universe is a God who created you and me in the details of our bodies and our personalities. And He cares about us so deeply that He would sacrifice His Son so we can be in fellowship with Him. We start to see that this exclusivity of Christ is not because God arbitrarily decided that here's one way that I like more than other ways. We start to see that this is the only way. Like drinking water is the only way for you to survive when your options are windshield washer fluid and motor gearbox oil. It is only through Christ, because Christ is God who became man. God, Christ is both God and both man. And so He makes that bridge. He opens that way for us to, to connect with God, to participate with God, to have fellowship with God, to be in His presence and to be in relationship with Him. It only comes through Jesus Christ. He's the only one who is God and man at the same time. So the exclusivity is not because of arbitrariness. The exclusivity is because this is really the only way that there is. Now what John is saying, he says, when we abide in the light, 
we won't walk in darkness. When we abide in Him, when we live rightly, we are going to live our lives by abiding in Christ. In John 15, in his gospel, he writes this beautiful passage about the vine and the branches and how the branches have to remain in the vine, otherwise there will be no fruit. The branch doesn't have to work too hard. It's not about the branch making stuff happen, but it's about the branch being connected to the vine, which produces the fruit. And this is Christian living. This is the living rightly, is living in this abiding in the vine, this being connected to Christ and to the Father. Because whoever is connected to the Son is connected to the Father. John is making this very clear in his letter. So again, loving your brother is walking in the light. Hating your brother is not understanding the light, is not understanding God's way, not understanding how God the Father has designed us as human beings to live and how He wants this world to operate. It's walking in darkness. So walking or right living then is... um, to walk the same way as Jesus walked, to keep the commandments, especially the great commandment of love. And then thirdly, living rightly is not to love the world. Remember that John is writing to believers here. He's not writing to those folks out there who who don't believe. He's writing to people who are believers. And he's saying that when you are a believer, you will face a temptation to love the world because you are in the world. If you were out of the world, you wouldn't face that temptation, but because you are living in the world, you will face that temptation. And John is writing to let them know they need to be aware of this and they need to be very careful how they live. He says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The world is passing away along with its desires. The world that John is referring to here. And this is tricky because he uses the word world, but we've got to try and decipher what does he mean when he uses that word. The world itself could mean something that is just not positive, not negative, that's just neutral. It's just the world that God made. In Genesis, we are told that what God made is good. In fact, it is very good. So there's a sense in which the world is very good because God made it. There is a world, there's a sense where the world is just neutral because it's just what it is. But John is actually using the word, the word world here in a negative sense. He is referring to the world that is in rebellion against God. The system of the world. It was not created by God but came about through the sinfulness of human beings. That's what John is referring to, that rebellious, sinful nature of mankind, the world. And he's saying that is passing away. Now, what does he mean that's passing away? Well, we saw the the illustration earlier of the sun coming up, the rays coming up, the light coming, and the darkness has to go. Well, this darkness that has to go is the sinful world, the rebellious world. It will go. Once Christ has come, and this is John's message, he comes back to Christ again and again and again. But once Christ has come, the light has started shining. The sun has, the new dawn has happened. And it's just a matter of time before the darkness is all gone. This rebellious world is going to be gone and the whole world will be under the lordship of the Father and the Son. So the world is passing away with its desires. 
But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So those people who don't give in to the desires of the world, those people will abide forever. In a sort of schematic way, I can put it like this. Those who love the world and those who love God are two different groups of people. Now, those who love the world need to know that the world is transient and the world is passing away. The world, the world system, the, the rebelliousness against God, the sin, the, the way that, that the world operates where um, those people with power get more status, those people with more money get more status, those people with um, more abilities and gifts, they get more status, all of that is going to pass away. But God is eternal and will never pass away. So those who love the world love that which is transient and that which is passing away. But those who love God loves what is eternal. Those who love the world is focused on temporary life. Because the life that they live is the life that originates in this world. What is important to them, what they are aspiring to, what they value, is in the world system. And that is temporary. Because why? Because the world is passing away, the world system. So whatever comes from there is temporary. And whatever comes from God, who is eternal, is eternal. So the life that comes from God is eternal life. You know, as we can see, very different from the temporary life that comes from this world. The temporary life that comes from this world will lead to the person who lives that kind of life and chooses that kind of life to pass away. But on the other hand, the person who loves God and chooses eternal life is the person who will remain forever. It's very clear in John's writing that there's two ways you can go. You can love the world and the desires of the world, and he talks about the desires of the flesh, talking about the flesh there meaning sinful humanity. You can choose that, but just know that that's transient and that's passing away. Or you can choose love of God, which means eternal life, and you will never pass away, but you will remain forever. These are the choices. And John is writing to say, be mindful of this. Be careful. Because you are in the world, but you're not of the world. And so, because you are in the world, you will find these temptations... And when they come, you need to choose which way you're going to go. Right living is about walking the way that Jesus walked. It's about keeping the commandments of Christ. And it's about not loving the world. Choosing against that for God. He says, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Very clear. Now, right living is not even possible without true faith. True faith, knowing who God is and being in a relationship with God is going to bring us to the place of right living. John says, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. The only place in the Bible that the word Antichrist is used is in John. John is the guy that uses that term. Anti meaning against, Antichrist being against Christ. Who is against Christ? John says many people are against Christ. There have been many people who are anti-Christ. But he brings it to this. He says, this is he, the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. True faith is someone who doesn't deny 
that Jesus is the Christ. True faith is someone who's whose mind and whose heart has been illumined to know that Jesus is exclusive, exclusively, Jesus is the only way to the Father, and Jesus is the Christ. The Christ being the Messiah, the Anointed One. It's only when you realize that Jesus is the Messiah that you will have true faith. That true faith will evidence itself in you through your right living. If there's no evidence for the true faith, then it's not true faith. This is what John and James and all the, the writers are telling us. But if we have the true faith, it's going to do its work in us. And we are going to start living in the light, walking as Jesus walked, keeping his commandments. And we are going to not love the world. In the end um, of this passage, John ends in verse 29. He says, If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. What he's doing here, right at the end, is to bring together the true faith and the right living. The true faith is that first part that's bolded out. If you know that he is righteous, this is Jesus Christ. If you know that he is righteous, and he's not just talking about knowing as in something that you can grasp intellectually, but he's talking about what you understand with your mind and what you sense in your heart and what you know experientially. If you truly know that Jesus is righteous, if you truly know that He is the Christ, He is the Messiah, if you truly know that, if you have, in other words, if you have true faith, then He says, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of Him. Practicing righteousness is right living. He's connecting the true faith with the right living. And saying, when you see both of those together, you can know that this person who has the true faith, who practices righteousness, has been born of God. This is the only way this can happen, is to be born again. It's interesting that John starts this passage in verse 3 by saying, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Because right there, he's bringing together true faith and right living. We know that we have come to know him, that we have true faith, if we keep his commandments, if there's right living. So he starts the passage with true faith and right living, and he ends it with true faith and right living. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. John's message to believers is that they should make sure that their faith is true and they should make sure that they live out their true faith through right living. I think that message stands for you and for me just as strongly, just as validly as it did for those who heard John the first time. Let us pray. Father God, as we listen to what John is saying, Lord, we examine ourselves to see if we have true faith. And if it translates to right living. I know many times we fall short and we ask that you forgive us. And ask that you strengthen us. And ask that you fill us with your spirit. But Lord, I also pray for a, a confidence. A confidence to know that yes, we, ha we have true faith because we see that we are living righteously. To know that we are born of you. Born again. Sons and daughters of the King Most High. Made so through the Son, Jesus Christ, and Him alone. 
Pray that we would walk in this confidence each and every day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.